Content warning. This episode of Black Girl Watching contains talk of suicide, sexual assault, and rape. Please proceed with care. Somebody, anybody, sing a Black Girl song. Bring her out to know herself, to know you. But sing her rhythms of caring and struggle. Welcome back to Black Girl Watching, where we break down your favorite films and TV shows. I'm Brooke Obi, film critic, writer, editor, and screenwriter. And I'm Brittany Danielle. I'm a writer, editor, and cultural critic who loves watching and reading Black art. And today we're super excited to talk about episode five of HBO's Lovecraft Country, Strange Case. So if you want to join in on the conversation, be sure to use the hashtag Black Girl Watching on Twitter and Instagram. And you can also tweet us at BLKGRL watching to share your thoughts, ask your questions, check out our website, blackgirlwatching.com, leave a comment there as well, and get in on this conversation. If you have any questions, if you have any theories, we want to hear it all. And before we start diving into this episode, just a warning, this this podcast contains spoilers. So if you have not watched episode five or any any of the episodes before it, um, you might want to pause, go watch the show, and then come back to join us for this conversation and discussion on Lovecraft, episode five. And we have a very, very special guest as usual. We have Cheryl Dunier joining us today. She is an iconic filmmaker and the director of episode five. She is responsible for many of our favorite episodes of our TV shows, Queen Sugar, David Makes Man, Lovecraft Country. She's been involved in like the best black television of the past decade. So we're really excited to have the conversation with her about how her entire trailblazing career as the director of The Watermelon Woman and so many films in the queer black canon influenced Lovecraft episode five. So we're really excited to have her. So stay tuned for that. Let's get into it. Let's what get did you into think it. of episode five? Oh my God. Um, <laughs> the only thing I can say is like, Ruby, you in danger, girl. Like at the end of last episode, we knew she potentially was getting put into peril. Um, as soon as she saw William at the bar and went home with him, I was just like, Ruby, no, Ruby, no, Ruby, no, don't do it. And, uh, yeah, this episode for me was full of a lot of Ruby nose. Yes. I mean, I so I like to call this episode Karen's Interrupted because we've got two Karen situation. This is a this is a double Karen. Mm. Um we've got Ruby who transform metamorphosizes into a white woman. And then we have the original uh white woman, white feminist, Christina. And both of these women have been interrupted in ways that they feel are unfair. And it's really, really interesting to see how they are trying to make that right, trying to justify the things that they're doing in order to get the things that they want um, and the people that they put in danger in the process of doing that. So let's get into this episode. Let's get into the recap and just break down what foolishness is happening um, in this episode. So like you said, you know, she goes home with William in episode four. They have very uncomfortable sex on the stairs, but it looks really hot, even though it's super gross, but also just kind of hot a little bit. Um, and now she is waking up in bed, but she is waking up as a white woman and she's named herself Hillary. And this is really interesting because in the book, Ruby wants to be a Sherpa um, for a mountain climber. So it's actually based on the mountain climber of Mount Everest, whose name was Hillary. And so that's why she names herself Hillary in the book. They don't really explain that in the show and it's not really that important, but it's you know, it's definitely a, a perfect white girl name, I think. So she names herself Hillary, but at first, you know, she is just completely disoriented. She has no idea what's going on. She's freaking out. She runs away from the house. She winds up back on the South side, interacting with all these black people. And she's trying to tell them, my name is Ruby Baptiste. And they're like, what is going on with this white woman? But, you know, nobody, nobody can help her. Nobody recognizes her. And she's just out there in a, does she have a bathrobe on? Like what is, she's not wearing 
proper clothing. Yeah. She not even a bathrobe, but like one of those uh fancier silk right. robe right. situations. And so then she knocks over this little black boy while people were trying to help her out. All of a sudden the police show up and she instinctively puts her hands up. Like it's just like black instincts kicking in. Um, she puts her hands up so the police know that she is not a threat, but they're not going after her. They're going after this little boy that she pushed on the ground. And they're like about to like assault this little boy. And she honestly takes a bit too long for my comfort to stop them from doing that. Fortunately, she does stop them, but I'm like, what is going on? Like, I know she's confused or whatever, but it really made me uncomfortable how long it took her to step in and protect this little boy from the threat of police. I think, um, and this is something that continues to happen throughout the episode when Ruby is Hillary. She doesn't, um call out or question or step in and there's even a a line later on that ruby says about she always wondered which was harder being a woman or being black and i'm like well why don't you put those two things together (laughs) why don't you put those two things together like being a black woman is clearly harder than each one of those singular things you know what i mean like Ruby still has some weird, respectable Negro Karen energy um, that she's been carrying this whole series so far. But it really kind of comes through when she's able to be Hillary because she can, I feel like, express herself and not have the same consequences. It still makes her uncomfortable the way Black people are treated, which is why she, you know, eventually sticks up for the kid. But I do think part of Ruby Baptiste looks down on some people, even though these are the same people in her community. And as we've been talking about this whole show or this whole podcast, like these are the people that she needs to be in community with. And that is how she survived. So I don't know. You in a lot of danger, girl. And I think that's kind of the point, too. I mean, for one, you don't have to be non-Black to be anti-Black. So there are quite a few Black people, even people who would say that they love Black people and they love being a part of Black community, who still harbor anti-Blackness. You know, you look at, you know, Black celebrities or Black people who have reached a certain uh, status of wealth or like Ruby, who have achieved a certain amount of education. They have bought into this idea that their Blackness is negotiable. Mm -hmm. So once I reach this height, I should be treated a different way because I understand why you think in general, all black people, you know, should be treated poorly. Um, But I have proven that I'm a different kind of black person. So I deserve to be treated differently. And that is where the Karen energy comes from, because there is an idea that You are entitled to a certain amount of things um, more than other people because of who you are. And it's very, very easy. Once you reach a certain status, you just kind of, you're a little bit separate. You know, you're a little bit separate from um, other, from the people in your community. That's the danger of white supremacy and anti-Blackness. When you buy into this at any level, you are in danger of being a threat to your people and to yourself. Because like that is a trap. Like there really isn't anything that you can do to negotiate your blackness and eventually going to be reminded that you're actually still black. You actually don't get access to this space of whiteness and you never, ever will. You can marry Kim Kardashian, but you will still be a Negro that we do not win our spaces. Mm -hmm. And, And I think that's where the colorism comes into play because Ruby has had such a completely different experience than Letty as a dark skinned and full figured black woman. She is more susceptible to being lured into this world of whiteness and privilege because her life experience has been so much more different. And be- and because she has she has the least amount 
not of access to it, but she's been, she's probably been the most marginalized, you know, because of her, you know, color, because of her shape. Not to say like, if you're a dark skinned black woman or a plus size black woman, like I am, like, you're going to just be like, oh my God, this white man, he's, he's so great. Like, but we saw it in episode one when they're, when Ruby is performing at the block party and Letty just pops up and everybody's like, oh my God, Letty, get on stage with your like and then it became all about Letty so I think you know I think that they are making a particular point um when it comes to colorism I think that it's a it's a really difficult point to make because you don't want to generalize but I think Ruby specifically um is and so that's how she ends up entangled with William and entangled as Hillary because I don't know I think like I want to say any 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 normal person but you do have black people who are like huh wonder what it's like to be white but I don't know if they would approach it in the same way Ruby seems to where she just gets caught up in the Karen energy like I think if I was magically turned white like I would be like a woke white person hopefully like you would use your privilege to help other people like she would have leapt into action like you mentioned to protect that boy from almost getting his head cracked by the police I just don't like the way Ruby is is using this new newfound privilege but I also think it is clearly going to backfire on her and I hope it doesn't in a way that kills her because I you know I don't know or you know brings down or helps Christina slash William to win because they cannot win that's all I care about she can't win well and so you know that kind of goes to another another point about basically how we fight how we fight white supremacy um, which I think has been the theme of the entire show like, how do Black people, what are the tools that Black people can use to fight white supremacy? So right now, we have Ruby, who's using this potion, and she's fighting white supremacy in a very Kanye way, which is, if I have a seat at the table, then Black people are winning. And so she's been wanting to work at Marshall Fields the entire time. She was unable to do so last episode. She found out that uh, they had hired another Black woman, and she knew that they would never hire two Black women to work in this white department store. So this episode, as Hillary, when she transforms into Hillary, the first thing is that she has a fantastic day. She has this wonderful day where she doesn't spend any of the money that William gave her because she doesn't have to. She goes to get ice cream from the store and they just give her the ice cream for free. Um, people move out of her way. People treat her like a lady. People, um, you know, think that she is a human being worth basic attention and respect and courtesy. And it's just this amazing new world for her. And as she's walking around this first full day as Hillary into Zaka Shange's for color girls who have considered suicide when the rainbow is enough, um, there's a poem that's playing at the same time as that, which is so uncomfortable. It's sing a black girl's song. So this black girl in white people's skin is walking around while this sing a black girl song is playing and she has opportunity and she's been given all the things that the black girl is singing about in For Colored Girls is happening while Hillary is walking around enjoying her day. It's extremely, extremely unsettling. And I think that it's supposed to be. Yeah, for sure. Because <laughs> the only way Ruby can have this experience as is as a white woman. And so that's the the uncomfortable and unsettling part because, you know, black women just want to be treated like regular people. We don't want to be bothered. We want to get the same respect and, you know, all that all women would want. They don't want to have undue burdens placed upon them. Everybody wants to have a carefree experience to just be who you are. But unfortunately for black women and other, you know, 
perhaps other women of color as well, we don't get to have that. And so Ruby is getting to have that, but, but the only way she's getting to have it is as a white woman. So I think they're commenting clearly on the fact that black women can't fully, especially in 1955, fully live their lives, fully be themselves, be treated as human beings because just of racism, right? And sexism. Not even in 2020 can that happen. Right. I mean, even... Uh, you can't even be uh, an African-American studies professor at George Washington University as a Black woman. You so. have to be a white woman pretending to be Black. Um, same thing with uh, Rachel Dolezal. She was also a professor, right? I mean, like, these white women are out of control. And I think that was that's really the point I think that's so upsetting for Ruby is... Once she becomes, she gets this job at Marshall Field, she is the assistant manager, not even a sales clerk, which is all she was aspiring to be. But as a white woman with her credentials, she gets to be assistant manager right away. She has a boss who is like, thinks she's the most wonderful thing in the world, which never would happen if she was a black woman. She goes straight to the top, but all she can see is, you know, and she, when she's in the back room and she's listening to these white women that are her employees talking about Tamara, the only black sales clerk, talking about black people in general, she's very uncomfortable. Like, you know, this is what y'all talking about. Like, you know, we're, we're white. Like we don't have anything else to talk about, but what black people are doing. And then what the white women that she, that who work for her want to do in their spare time, they want to go to the South side. They want to go to Sammy's where she regularly plays. She winds up yelling at Tamara for doing something in an imperfect way, in her opinion. And when her manager comes by to ask Hillary if everything is okay with Tamara. She's like, oh yeah, Tamara was just telling me about how she's going to take us all down to the South side. So she not only is berating her employee, she's also subjecting her to harassment outside of work. Nobody wants to go out and hang out with their colleagues, especially if you're the only Black person in a hostile environment. Employees quit when she started working there. It's a hostile environment for her already. And so nobody wants to go out with their racist coworkers in their spare time. And so Hillary, in covering up for herself and what she's doing that's out of line by yelling in the middle of the department store, is to put Tamara in even more danger. It's just, it's, it's very disturbing. And I think it's at that point when they're all out at Sammy's and the white women are so excited to be dancing with Negroes. Like, she's like, I'm over this. And she breaks the bottle, uh, the potion that William has given her to turn her back into a white, to turn her back into a white woman when the spell wears off. And she's just over it kind of completely at that point. Yeah, I totally agree. By the end, it does seem like Ruby um, kind of comes back to herself. But I, I, I just want to go back a little bit um, to talk more about like how we think this whole metamorphosis occurs. I know that William gives Ruby the potion that helps to turn her into Hillary, but in the beginning, like, you know, after she's freaking out, she just becomes Hillary. The police take her home and they're like, oh, her husband says she goes through these fits. And so as she's going home, like something is crawling through her skin and I'm guessing that is Ruby trying to get out but we don't know for sure and when she gets home um William has all this plastic laid out on the floor and then he pulls out a giant butcher knife and stabs her and then he's pulling stuff out of her or, or off yeah. of her or whatever like I want to know, like, what is happening? Because if you pulled out a giant butcher knife and stabbed somebody, even if they had metamorphosized into something else, you would probably kill them. So, like, I'm com I was a little bit confused about that part and, like, what was happening in that moment. I think it's a death. I think it's a death. I think every time she becomes the... We don't ever see her become the white woman. We always see her become herself again. So I think that white shell has to die every single time. Because you see, even when she is running away 
because she feels the transformation coming after she gets hired as assistant manager and the manager wants to take her around and give her a tour and she's trying to run away because she feels the transformation coming back and the spell is breaking. So she runs away, she gets into, you know, a back elevator to hide while she's doing this metamorphosis and her neck breaks. So you see, like, I, I do think that it is a death, like this white skin, this white creature has to die for her to come back out every single time time like that is the metamorphosis but why does he need a butcher knife she was already going through the change he could have just let her i think the first time can take a long time i'm thinking like maybe these are like the old guard rules like the first time you die it takes a really (laughs) really really long time so he was just kind of speeding up the process and she was fighting and he said when you fight it it takes longer so i think he was just trying to speed up the process um, but also you see later on in this episode when Christina is trying to convince Ruby to take this stone and put it into, um, the Captain Lancaster's office for a, you imagine that it's going to, it's some magical stone that they can cast some kind of spell or something like that. As a result of it being in his office, Christina is telling Ruby to please do this if you care at all for William, which why in the fuck does she care about William? Like that, that threw me off. But anyway, she was like, if you care right. at all for William, you know, you need to do this thing because they shot him in the back and threw him in the river and they, you know, expected him to die. And the reason of course, that William doesn't die is because William is Christina. So I think it just sped along the process. So like, right. yeah, you know, for one, I think that Christina can't die, but also, I think when you are in that other character, maybe you can't die either. Like your your true self can't die. Yeah, your true self can't die, um, you know, because you have the death when you're coming back into who you actually are. And I think that's saying something too, like you are, you lose yourself when you desire and covet whiteness, when you are anti-Black, when your goal is to achieve uh, whiteness. There is a part of you that that you're killing. Um, you're killing in order to fit into mm-hmm. this mold of acceptability under white supremacy. So I understand that completely, like from a metaphor standpoint, and that you know you got to kill all that if you if you're ever going to get back to your true self. You got to you got to kill all that. You really do. You have to kill the anti blackness within you. You have to kill the desire for whiteness. The um, desire to conform under white supremacy. Yeah. Every time (laughs) the transformation happens, it's just gruesome. Um, And that time with the butcher knife, like as he's, I guess, cutting Hillary's body off of Ruby, there is a a fake news report about Kenyan locusts and how they shed their skin and become mature. And then they devour everything in their path which kind of gets echoed later on in the ballroom scene with Sammy because Sammy performs something called locusta migratoria, which is like migrating locusts. So I, I thought that was a two kind of interesting things that happened. No, yeah, I was just going to say like, yeah, this episode is about metamorphosis for quite a few of the characters, you know, including... Montrose. And so Sammy's dance for the locusts that are are shedding their skin may also be, you know, kind of a tribute to Montrose and his coming out because this is definitely his coming out party episode. Mm -hmm. A literal party too. He gets to finally be himself um, in a in a very safe space. But before we can celebrate Montrose, Montrose got to get his ass kicked for killing Yahima. Tick and Letty are in the house and they're going up there to try to maybe get Yahima some food and try to start teaching Yahima English so they can get Yahima's help. And instead of seeing Yahima in the room, they see Montrose in the room. And it's just so funny the difference in reactions and it's because you know tick knows his father and letty is still she knows montrose but she doesn't know montrose and so her first reaction is oh yahima got away maybe we can find yahima like maybe we can find them and they couldn't have gotten far and the whole time letty is talking about you know trying to go find yahima tick is like 
staring at his father because he knows. Plus, Montrose's fingers are bloody. <laughs> so that's also a sign. And then he asked, like, oh, and Titus's papers. And then Montrose doesn't say anything. But at that moment, Tick knows that those are gone too. So he just starts beating the shit out of Montrose for all of these things. And it takes a couple of men in the boarding house to pull Tick off of Montrose. And he is rightly upset. And it's so heartbreaking too, because, you know, last week we really focused on the heartbreak of Yahima and Yahima's lost life and Yahima's lost potential, rightfully so. But we didn't quite touch on how much Tick and Montrose had bonded in episode four. This was at a point in time when they had been at odds so many times, but during this voyage, Montrose had given fatherly advice to Tick. He's telling him he should apologize to Letty. Here's how you should act when you know your your girl is upset with you so that you can make sure to remember the love and all these like really great like unmontros like you know loving you know anecdotes that he's sharing with his son um and tick you know being someone who has not received this level of attention or you know quiet um, kind of love uh, from his father before um, is kind of eating it up. He's really appreciating it. And at the end of that episode, right before Montrose commits this heinous murder, Montrose puts his hand on Tick's shoulder. He's telling him, you know, you're a good boy. You're a good man. You turned out so much better despite all the stuff that I did to you. It's the thing that a child, like young Tick, wanted to hear from his father all those years growing up. And it was kind of like a healing had happened in that space. So to get to this point too, where he's really realizing this is all a lie. This is all a sham. He is never going to be who I need him to be. And he's beating him, not just for the murder of Yahima, not just for the lost papers of Titus, but literally for all the things that he has ever done to Tick in their entire relationship. And he literally almost kills him. And he, and he may have killed him if not for all of those men that have to pull Tick off of Montrose. And the Montrose face is really showing that he was near death yeah and he and he's he doesn't fight back because he knows he's guilty of everything <laughs> like he's guilty of killing yahima he's guilty of probably burning or getting rid of titus's papers and he's guilty of abusing tick and beating tick when he was a child and being too hard on him and not being more loving and more soft with him when tick was younger and so he just takes it i think he feels like well, this is the adequate punishment, so I'm just going to take it. I'm not going to fight back. And, you know, later on, he tries to find a little bit of comfort with Sammy. But even in that interaction, it's not comforting for both of them. Yes, they have this love scene that's like scored. I mean, oh, let's just call it a sex scene because it's not really about love at all. No. It's very much take off your pants, no words, no affection, you know, bend over kind of situation, spit in my hand, you know, and Frank Ocean's um, song is playing. Is that who that was? It was Frank Ocean's Bad Religion playing. And it's basically talking about being in a relationship with someone who doesn't love you and keep you keep going back to somebody who doesn't love you and doesn't treat you right. And that's what is happening. Montrose is that person. And Sammy's just like, okay you know, this is what you need, then fine. I've accepted where we're at in this space and I enjoy being with you. So it's, you know, I'm, I'm just accepting that. Sammy tries to kiss and comfort and be affectionate with Montrose and he's not having it. And I think what it goes to show more so um, about who Montrose is, is that he's a person who has never received or been able to receive love. 
um, doesn't believe that he's worthy of love, probably because of his relationship with his own father. And so that's what he's doing. He's rejecting. He's ex he laid there and accepted the mm -hmm. punishment from Atticus because he feels like that's what he deserves. He's not going to accept a kiss or affection from Sammy because he doesn't feel that he is deserving of those emotions mm -hmm. or behaviors. Right. Right. It definitely makes for two uh, <laughs> very intense scenes. Another tense scene kind of after Tick beats Montrose within an inch of his life. He, he, he goes down to the dark room. He's trying to see if Letty had taken any pictures of the papers before they were disposed of by Montrose. And he's still very angry. And so when Letty confronts him, cause he's like, did you take any picture? He's like still very riled up. She confronts him with a bat. Like <laughs> she was like, okay, first of all, you're not going to do me like Montrose. So let me bring this bat down here. And she, in, in that moment, he kind of comes back to himself, especially when he sees her holding this bat and he's like, oh shit. In his mind, it's like, well, I don't want her to be afraid of me, which is something that he tells her in another scene. I mean, because yeah, on that point too, like if you don't want people to be scared of you, then don't do scary things. You know what I'm saying? Like, so that's, I don't know. Tick is starting to get on my nerves, but only in relationship to Letty. Like, I feel like mm -hmm. they he doesn't need to be this annoying because... If they weren't in a relationship, then they could just be friends and there would be a different, there would be like less pressure on their relationship or him as a person. He obviously is not in a place where he can even be in a healthy relationship with Letty right now anyway. And so the way that he behaves, he just comes off as a jerky man and like Letty can do better. Yeah. And yet here we are in the garage. <laughs> <laughs> She brings the the film, I guess, to say that she actually took the pictures. They have a really steamy sex scene, which, you know, on the other side of it, nice to see black people having black sex um, on screen. And it was it was better than the first yeah, one, honestly. Yeah, like, you know, there sure. was more time, there was more passion, there was more care um, with what was going on, um, especially now that Tick has all the information that he did not have the first time that they had sex. So, you know, it's, it's definitely, it's a very lovely scene. For sure. And I think, you know, he's not Montrose, but they are also very similar in the fact that they're both pig headed. They're both very, very stubborn. They both think that they're very right and they're willing to go through or do just about anything to prove that they're right, which is for Montrose, killing Yahima and getting rid of Titus's papers. But for Tick, like, still trying to figure it out and still forging ahead. So it's just interesting. And they're that, also violent. And they're also violent. So it's interesting to see both of those characters have love or sex scenes in this episode. And I think that is a purposeful choice. And to see the difference in their experiences too. Whereas Tick is not struggling with feeling worthy in this particular manner and Montrose is, but it, it's interesting to see two different kinds of black couples or somewhat couples um, having sex, which is, it, it's not something that we see. We don't see this normally. I agree with that. And, but I also do think that they are actually having similar struggles because at the point when Tick and Letty have their sex scene, Tick is trying to prove, you know, he has a whole conversation with Letty in advance. He's talking to her about the fact that his father was so violent with him and he never believed he could be that person. But when he went to the Korean War, that violence that was trained in him based on his own abuse and history of being abused was triggered. And he was actually able to rise to the occasion and be as violent as he needed to be. Now, we still don't know all that Tick has done, but we know that he's struggling with that. Um, and he's struggling to be forgiven uh, mm -hmm. for the things that he did in Korea, which actually comes up later on in the episode as well. So, yeah, I do think that, you know, Tick and Montrose, whether Montrose is his biological father or not, you know, Tick is his son, in that he was raised by him yeah. and shaped and molded by him. And there is this, you know, idea of Tick not 
understanding fully if he is deserving of love because of the way that his father treated him for the majority of his life. So we'll have to see where Tick and Letty are going to go and if this is a relationship that actually needs to happen in order for both of them to become the characters that they'll be by the end of Mm -hmm. the series. But the other couple that we are seeing in this episode, uh, Montrose and Sammy, Um, Sammy has taken Montrose to, I'm just going to say Sammy. I don't know if there are other pronouns for Sammy or if if Sammy is trans or if this is a drag show situation because those are very separate things. So in the absence of that, I think we'll just say Sammy. So Sammy's taking Montrose to Sammy's pageant where Sammy is all dressed in drag along with Sammy's drag sisters. They're all in the makeup room getting ready for this ball. And Sammy is, you know, taking care of Montrose's face, covering it with makeup so that he doesn't look as near death as he actually was. Um, And at this point too, the other drag sisters are mocking Sammy and Montrose because they know that Montrose won't kiss Sammy. They've never kissed before. So Sammy is clearly back here spilling all the tea behind (laughs) Montrose's back. So I guess at this point too, Montrose knows that everybody in this place knows that he is in this relationship, that it's a queer relationship, and that he's a queer person. And so as uh, Sammy, uh, during the, when the pageant ballroom actually starts, and, and, and Sammy is performing this dance, um, you see Montrose shed this skin, this, this like toxic um, right. unworthiness that he's been carrying with him, this shame, this guilt, this fear, and in this space of of love where he's just being loved on by all of these drag queens who are dancing with him. They're smiling. They're just affirming him. Like kind of echoing back to church, you know, like especially if you grew up in a Pentecostal church um, (laughs) where, you know, you go from bopping along or somebody goes from bopping along to like full on turn themselves over to the Holy Spirit. And that's what it, it looks like to me for Montrose. Like he caught the Holy Spirit and he caught his, yeah, he caught his redemption, right? Like, or his freedom in that moment. And that is when he goes over and grabs Sammy and pulls Sammy into this very, very tender kiss that is, it's just like he that's when he feels comfortable enough to kiss Sammy and to be kissed and to be kissed and I think this is a really good time for us to talk to the director of this episode Cheryl Dunyay welcome to Black Girl Watching Cheryl oh thank you for having me I, I love your you know podcast it's amazing that um you know I'm, I'm here you know it's, it's it's so important to be included in a dialogue about black women representation cinema, all my favorite things. And this episode is amazing and you're amazing in it. Um, We're going to get into like how you were able to achieve some of these amazing scenes because there's a lot of like really heavy themes that this episode deals with. Like there's so much that we're dealing with colorism, tokenism, sexuality. So what actually drew you into this script? Well, um, first I must thank everybody, you know, including the goddesses and gods um my ancestors because they are they they're part of what drew me into the script and having that relationship with memory and family and um cinema history and photography um so you know when i got the script from misha i and 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 i must say that sonia and jay wrote and misha wrote an amazing script i i couldn't believe that i got to tell this story it's you know, there's so many surprises and it, I, I was just in awe. So I had to use all my instincts to really, you know, sort, sort it out um, and, and really break down, you know, how to, you know, address all those things that you mentioned, right? So it was a wonderful opportunity to use all my skills as a director. I had just come off a, a, a powerful season of being a producing director on uh, Ava's Queen Sugar, so, you know, I was putting just all the director's hat on and I went full charge into, you know, breaking it down, right? So, you know, one of the amazing things about Misha is her use of uh, contemporary, you know, contemporary references, uh, 
photography references from the black canon. Um, and I wanted to, you know, continue that. And, you know, I have my own canon, which is black and queer. So I, I was trying to find, and, and my script was filled with it. So I, I really started to look for those references um, that I would draw upon um, in, in photography as well as cinema. And, you know, I, I really, it, 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 it was amazing. I had to kind of lay that all out. And if, there's so many riches. Uh, and so I just really wanted to trust my instinct when that happened. So, um, you know, I was really being faithful to, you know, what Misha, you know, puts overall on, on the episode. And she's very clear about what she wants. She's a wonderful collaborator, um, as well as the, the, the talented cast. So um, me and Michael Watson, my, my DP, we really sort of sat down and, and looked at what I was bringing to the table in the sense of the references. So look for references to uh, Fassbender's Corel, um, Michelle Parkinson's Storm A Lady of the Jewel Box Review, um, a variety of Jet magazines from the 50s. I have a whole collection here of my own that actually was so interesting that there there's um, very iconic images in some jets about um, black gay life. Uh, in, wow. in the fifties, which, yeah. So I, I, you know, I pulled those out. Um, and then one of my favorite films, Carmen Jones, right? 1955, Otto Preminger. Um, and there's a performance in there that has such life by, um, uh, uh Pearl Bailey is singing, beat out that rhythm on the drum. And these dancers are just like going off the hook. So I really wanted to kind of put that in there because there was a couple of dance bits in, in my, uh, episode. So, you know, laying out what I wanted to wrap was sort of, you know, the first thing to tackle. Um, the, se the second thing to tackle is really, you know, how much time do I get to have rehearsal? And luckily, this, you know, uh, you know, Misha, you know, fearless leader, guaranteed, you know, her directors to have the tools that they need to tell their story. Beyond equipment, which, you know, was off the hook, was having the time to really break it down and rehearse. So um, I, I, you know, got all my actors into the right mindset and we just rehearsed it all the time. Um, I, I, I must say that, you know, um, Jamie and Woomy, um, who are doing a major transformation in my um, episode, um, Jamie, Jamie plays Del Hillary or Hillary, who is the, 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 the white body that um, uh, Ruby transforms into when she um, works at uh, the department store. So when those transformations happen, those two had to be sort of in sync with their performances, right? So I had to kind of, you know, work with them to look at each other, see what their, you know, movements were and make sure they sort of overlap and, and were very similar. The same thing I had to do um, with, you know, other talent in it as well. I had to take Jordan and Abby, who are um, actually having transformations in their bodies in my episode. Um, and, and have their movements be in sync. As both those characters are, and in the storyline are drinking this magic potion that transforms them, right? So I had to make sure that they were doing the same thing. So a lot of rehearsal was spent on that. Um, and then, uh, you know, I got to really, uh, instead of having the, you know, the tension in the desire between, um, uh, uh, Atticus and Letty, you know, um, uh, 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 Jonathan and Journey, I got to slow it down, right? I got to be, uh, you know, show that they were, you know, show the, the quieter and softer moments that really w w were about their attraction. So, you know, I got to really kind of dip into the sort of love thing in, in this. So, you know, again, there are many, many things in this episode. In, in particular, the biggest trans character that I think transforms a lot is the brilliant Michael K. Williams, right? Um, he had to go through so much in his character from, you know, where we left off in 104 with, uh, you know, him in a really bad space in the sense that he killed, you know, Yahima and, and, you know, in a violent way. And, you know, that's the whole other topic of discussion. I'm just going to focus on my episode. Um, and, uh, you know, he transforms from that into, you know, digging into his own personal um, desire and you know, hidden desire, he, you know, has to kind of come out in a way. So I had to kind of deal with his sexuality and how it affirmed him uh, by the end of my, uh, and healed him, I would say, by the end of my episode. Speaking of that, um, on social, there were, you know, there was some concern after episode four about the Yahima character and about how that particular character um, 
was killed. But of course, you know, people didn't know episode five was coming. They didn't know if there would be any more exploration of different types of perhaps queer characters or two-spirit characters or intersex characters. Um, But considering this is sort of how you've been moving through your career, centering Black people and Black queer people. With this Montrose storyline, did you feel any sort of extra responsibility to get it right? Or just did it feel just really in line with your mission and your career up until this point? Um, I had to go. Uh, thank you for that question. I, uh, I I really, you know, you know, I'm a, a strong advocate in all my work to profile LGBTQ of color life, right? My main characters generally are queer women of color, you know, or, or, or trans uh, people of color. And, uh, you know, I am respectful for that. And I, I'm, you know, th- this, this, this whole project is respectful of that. But, you know, again, episode 104 had to push something to push back at something. I mean, you have to look at the whole show in, in, in the, the sense that it goes up and down. And, you know, we're right in the middle of, 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 of the whole season. And and so, uh, you know, 104 is going to get you, you know, riled up for, you know, 105 to sort of be a different kind of release. So, you know, I was okay about what, what was happening story-wise because I knew, right, rightfully that this was going to be revealed and explored and, and pushed to another level in my episode. So, you know, I, I understand, you know, there is a history of violence and, and we must really talk about that um, out loud, out loud. We must teach, we must instruct each other. We must, um, you know, really understand the language of what this culture does to destroy, um, you know, brown people, trans people and queer people and, you know, and, and speak out loud, right? So. Um, I think that in, in the sense of storytelling, um, you know, this, this script, uh, you know, really sort of uh, fills in those blanks um, and, and, and pushes, you know, our character, at least Montrose, to another level. And, you know, he gets to explore what his insides are. And speaking of Montrose and his transformation, you talked a little bit about the influences, you know, that, um, that you, you brought to this whole episode, but for this ballroom pageant scene, I think it's one of the most brilliant scenes of the series so far. It's amazing. And I mean, I just, uh, if you could like talk us through how you put that scene together. Oh, thank you. Um, so um, the the energy of, uh, uh, in, in the beat out that rhythm in the drum uh, scene in uh, Carmen Jones, and that dancing was something that I wanted to, you know, really bring to life. And there was a choreographer that I worked with, Jamaica, and she just really, we worked together, we looked at it, we studied it, and she just pulled the dancers together to, you know, help me. Um, and we had to find, you know, uh, you know, I, I wanted to be really, so a lot of my work, the junior mentory, is really about being um, true to um, the, you know, documentary or truth about queer life, as well as uh, the truth about queer narrative life, right? So. I had to kind of merge those two worlds in this. So I, I watched a lot of documentaries and I, I know from uh, my previous life as a film professor, um, I, you know, have a huge knowledge of the uh, queer canon in cinema. And so I really, again, drew on my references that I knew from those that are about, you know, really out in the sense of showing bodies and sex to those that are much more internal. And so I drew on those, you know, clearly. Um, Michelle Parkinson's film, Stormy Lady of the Jewel Box, um, which is a quiet film from the 80s about um, a, a, a black uh, butch who led this um, drag review in New York um, uh, with uh, and being the one, you know, quote unquote woman who had all these drag queens performing. And, and I, I really drew on that. So knowing Michelle, Michelle, who's actually my professor at Temple University, um, I, I, you know, went back to that film and went back to that moment, though that's sort of set in the early 60s, um, close enough to the, the 50s that we're dealing with in this, um, and really then dug into all those cinematic photographic references from, and I'm, I, I love Jet, you know, in the sense of those, those magazines from the 50s, um, because they include all aspects of Black life, and they're not ashamed to integrate, um, you know, Black gay life and lesbian life 
on, uh, you know, sensationalized, but definitely they incorporated it into um, what they were reviewing. It's like, you know, the, the, the magazine for, for black folks to read about black folks everywhere around the globe and see images of themselves. So there was, you know, there, there's, there's something there. There were pictures there. So I, you know, really pulled them out, looked at the costumes, you know, worked with my, you know, costume designer and um, set decorator to, um, I mean, uh, Karina really went down, uh, my production designer, to, um, you know, stylize the room, um, you know, make this a celebratory moment, um, you know, and, and really stage it so we could feel that, um, again, that transformation. Um, the one harder thing was, and, and this is what the brilliance of Misha and what she does in um, her, you know, uh, you know what she has on the, this show and what makes it so unique is that she adds contemporary, you know, music and, and flavor flavor to things. So um, knowing that this is going to be, um, you know, Neil dropped to uh, Itazaki Shange uh, poem, um, I had to time my, you know, what I had staged and, and choreographed to happen in that, you know, time period. I couldn't you know, have a whole scene, but we had, they said we had to rehearse the heck out of it um, to really make it time up. And all of it happened, you know, in a, a ballroom scene in, in, you know, in a minute or, you know, whatever minute and a half, I don't know how, how long it's going to, you know, how long it plays on the screen exactly. So that was, you know, a skill set of, again, Jamaica, myself, um, and, you know, all the talent, um, especially uh, having Montrose um, and, and Michael, you know, um, Michael going, you know, coming up, right, and, and being, lifting himself up and, and, and being liberated and, and embracing his lover. So uh, it was really about timing. It was really about everybody being on point. Um, it was really about the energy of, of those moments. And again, who doesn't love a big, you know, <laughs> performance drag scene, right? So right. Um, I just really went, went I, I went for it. Again, this, this show allowed me to use all my directorial skills from, you know, all facets, facets of my life. I mean, I, I started way, 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 way back in the late 80s, you know, doing video art, um, you know, went on to, you know, make features and, 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 and whatnot, Stranger Inside and whatnot. Um, and, and, and I, I was able to just draw on them and, and had to because everything was in my episode. Every bit of my, um, you know, skill set was, was, was put to use here. I mean, you're also known for another pretty iconic sex scene um, in your equally iconic film, The Watermelon Woman. And it stirred a little bit. I mean, people were people were pretty big mad about it back in the 90s. Um, and I don't know if you um, want to talk a little about about that controversy or how that came about. But I'm wondering how that experience of filming such an iconic sex scene um impacts the way that or if it had any impact on how you approach these two sex scenes as well or how you just approached sex scenes in the future um based on all of that right i mean sex is a natural thing right we have to think about it for right? whatever desire is, is you know you have to be honest with these things right but again within the context of you know ratings and shows and you know what's allowed what's not allowed you can't show it all you know this is you know this is not um you know, X tube or anything else, but you have to kind of give that feeling, right? So again, editing is key. You know, what you capture and angles are key. Um, in the watermelon woman, having to be myself as the character in it, in front of the camera as well as behind the camera, I left a lot up to the DP, right? Um, we talked about it way in advance. Um, we, you know, closed the set and uh, we, you know, it, it took time. Um, but what, what for me is it, not about seeing whole bodies all the time, but seeing um, bodies transitioning into positions of, you know, who's on top, who's not on top, what the hand holding, what the kissing is, what the, you know, flesh on flesh, um, you know, panning up and down the body. I mean, capturing other moments to give like a, a kind of poetry of the body or bodies. Mm -hmm. um, so that's what I always do when I, you know, choreograph. And I say choreograph um, sex scenes for because they're because they're not you know they're not sex scenes per se um, for the screen. Uh, so I, I really drew on that knowledge, and a lot of it is just again instinct, um, being afraid a little. I think I I, I I say that to my we're all in this together, 
we're all on the same page together. I mean, I, I really talk about the collaboration uh, process because, you know, we all are doing this together for, for the good of, you know, the show. Um, so we all are, you know, scared, excited, you know, intimidated. Uh, but we know that we have to do this to make the show more exquisite and, and, and more um, colorful and, and, and honest to what these characters and what the narrative, you know, has for it. So, you know, whenever I, even in like Stranger Inside, again, talent having to perform a sex scene in a, a church in a prison, um, you know, what you see, what you don't see, how people respond to what they're, they're um, experiencing on their face, playing things on their face a lot, or playing things on hands that are being held or not held. Um, you know, you, you get a lot uh, in silent moments, right, in, in, in cutaways. We talked a little bit about how the characters were in their emotional transformations um, throughout the show, but there is a physical transformation. Like there is an actual bloody, gory transformation of these characters um, that is just fascinating to me. It's very H.P. Lovecraft, but we never get to see body horror when it comes to Black people on screen. I think maybe Get Out, um, but nothing to this extent. You know, and so I wanted to know, like, what your approach was to, like, the physicality of them, like, becoming and what what that message um, was trying to convey as well. I mean, because usually body horror is supposed to be um, invoking feelings in the audience of, like, terror and feelings in the character of, of, of terror. But there's something, like, gross, I think, that happens when Black people <laughs> desire whiteness or strive for whiteness or, or some like there's a death that's happening i think that's kind of being conveyed here so i wanted to know what your uh, what your approach was to directing body horror um but also like what you think those messages were communicating so body horror here and and the physicality of what you know um happens between again um you know Rumi, uh, ruby and um hillary uh who's played by jamie newman and uh, uh Rumi masaka um, and then, uh, you know, Christine and William's body were, but that's, you know, on the white side. Um, for, for me, and I, I think if you think about, like, the glass ceiling of, of where you can go, uh, as a, as a black person, right? And, and what world you have to live in and how many years you can be around, um, the, the, of ne- being, you know, not recognized, um, not promoted, um, uh, you, you, you're, you're, you're enraged aside, right? If, if not having fantasies about killing somebody or, or not having fantasies about what if I were white, what would that look like? So I think this is the fantasy of it. I mean, I, I'm sure what this is the fantasy of it. And fantasies can go, I mean, you know, luckily it's just a fantasy. Um, and it's something that we, we really don't put out in the world. And, and luckily I'm able to just do it on the screen. Um, and, and, you know, we don't have to have that really, you know, living, uh, in the world. But, um, you go, I mean, so many moments I, I, you know, have gone through that in my own life as a black woman. I, you know, even as a young black child, um, I was at an all white school for 13 years. Um, and, and, you know, Lord knows there were many moments where, I, you know, was ready to take a pencil to somebody, right, for what they were saying and calling me. So um, this is just that, you know, let's let's just go to the extreme. Let's visualize this. Let's have a, a celebratory um, moment of it on the screen in all its extreme. Let's, let's screen it out. Um, let's play with genre um, and use that. And I think that's, you know, so much of, of what... Uh, you know, um, Jordan Peele's work is about, um, as well as Misha and the show. And, you know, uh, and so, you know, this is the space that allowed that, you know, uh, and um, so there is a, uh, you know, a, a pure sensitivity to it, it being um, performed and, and allowed. And so if you're going to do it, do it like to its extreme. So the blood, the gore, I must thank Kevin Banks for his, uh, the head of our visual effects department there, because you know, he really and his team, you know, really went to town about it. Like, you know, we need to just put more gook on them, you know, and then I'll be able to take it with my team into, you know, Viz Effect. Um, and, uh, you know, trust that it was, there's a lot of trust in, in, in making that, making that real. 
Um, but again, these are these are the fantasies that you see through a peephole as, as it happens in your mind and how you want to make make justice happen. Um, uh, and, um, you know, it, it, it rarely gets played out. And so you, this is this is, again, a strange case of it just playing out. And uh, I think there's a liberation around it. I think people are going to be um, like, damn, you know, this is <laughs> they did it. Right. <laughs> they meme it out or whatever they're going to do. Give it out. It's so great to. To see that, but again, these are things that we have to harbor in our mind as we sort of grudge through working in um, a not welcoming white world. Um, when we, you know, we're doing the same amount of work or even more, um, we're being demeaned. So, so we we harbor those feelings all the time. You know, luckily most normal people don't, you know, enact on them. And no, no, nor do I want anybody to enact on any of these. But um, it's it's very fun to see. Um, it, it's it's uh, it, it's it's just uh, you know again it's just a fantasy. It's just a fiction. Um, but you know, fortunately, it does you know have something to do with the the truth in our mind. I mean, you can't predict you know what the world is going to look like when an episode of television drops. But we've had this really interesting conversation, not a, a, about a black woman, you know passing as white or passing in a white society but over the past week or so about a white woman or a few white women academics like posing as black so this this feels once again um incredibly timely (laughs) as an episode um incredibly timely and I can't wait um, because this podcast is going to be coming out on Monday. I can't wait to see how people receive it and talk about it um, on social because that should probably definitely um, spark a lot of conversations as well. Oh, yeah. um, I'm, I'm ready. I'm, I'm sitting pretty for that, right? I'm going to say that. <laughs> I'm just I'm just waiting. I mean, I'm just like, okay. You know, I love the show. I love everything about it. I, you know, again, when I got this script, and I, you know, f- walked into the room and first saw Misha, you know, and face to face, I said, thank you. You had to bow down. Thank you for letting me tell this story. Because these are feelings that I felt, you know, my whole 54 years of life, you know, as being, you know, look, I was born in Africa. I'm a tribal chief's daughter, you know. Um, I, I had, you know, so much pride and, and, you know, whatever in my body and all black people do, right? But to be so disrespected to our bodies being disrespected to, you know, having to kind of play out scenarios in our mind um, all our lives, uh, you know, for, for me to be able to just, you know, make a fiction of it on a screen is, is, is a blessing in disguise. So I, 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 I know what it means and I know um, what it means. <laughs> um, and I just can't wait. I just can't wait. We can't wait either. But before we let you go, because we could literally talk all day and all night, probably about cinema. We want to get into your Jet Magazine collection and see what's in there. Um, (laughs) But before we let you go, uh, I just want to ask about your upcoming project. So you've been tapped to direct um, the pilot of Delilah, which is um, a new show coming to own uh, from the creators of Greenleaf. Um, What can you tell us about this project? Brilliant. Um, I mean, Craig Wright, brilliant, brilliant man. Um, Oprah, brilliant leader. Um, uh, you know, the whole team, uh, Mara Hill, Jill Jones, Susan Hayward, Ozzy, um, Akuga is, is, are, are going to just slam it. Uh, being, I mean, a, sure, a show where four black women as our, our number one to four on the list, um, is, is and, and somebody being a whistleblower. And, uh, you know, a, a black, black woman against two black friends who are women at having to, you know, who are lawyers who are in their own realm of law, trying to, you know, find justice for one case and having to go head to head and, and hold their friendship together or, or will it pull them apart? Uh, you know, I, I'm completely in, I'm, you know, and I'm, I'm all down to really um, bring everything that I have again to this pilot because it's something we don't ever see. You know, I, I give it to Oprah and I, I, you know, I must say I've been on uh, a variety of own shows, right? From, from, um, you know, Queen Sugar to David Makes Man to Love Is, you know, um, and now this, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm blessed. Uh, it, it's just blessed to be able to work with wonderful showrunners, a wonderful, you know, network who really are going to show all facets of, of Black life and the Black South, 
places that we don't know, right? This is set in uh, uh, Charlotte, North Carolina, um, another black city where, you know, we, you know, rarely get to see, um, you know, what really goes on there. And the truth of it, it's not, you know, people, you know, trucking and diving. It's people in, you know, law and, and power and community. And, and, and this one's about intrigue and, 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 and again, friendship. It's almost like, you know, we think about like, uh, you know, two, you know, strong black women friends and, and what you have to deal with and, and, and uh, black mothers who are single moms and, and, and their journey. But um, what Mr. Wright was able to do with this is create a poetry and create a, a um, you know, a story that it, it looks at the small moments, the everyday and the, the natural moments of, of what those relationships are. So I, I'm, 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 and that's really what I'm really good at is, is bringing out sort of truth of, 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 of fiction. And, and, and so, so look for that when, when it comes out. Love that. Love that. Thank you so much. Um, not just for this conversation and for shedding some insight into this. We definitely enjoyed that as well. But like you said, I mean, all the roles that you have played in building um, up our culture um, and putting it and documenting it and on screen, um, whether it's TV and all the iconic black shows that you've been a part of there or in the film world. We just thank you for your for your contribution and for your work and for loving us like you can tell when a black creative loves black people like it just comes across in their work so much. Um, and so we just appreciate you so much for that. It's, we love each other, and there's there's something that we have to be thankful for. Um, you know, our ancestors are with us. Um, we didn't come all this way for for nothing. So you know, we have bigger bigger things to do, and and we just need to do them um, to to make that you know to make that change. I mean, I'm, uh, again, I, I'll just leave one you know one of the the stronger imprints on me as a young artist was having to read Audre Lorde's work. Meet Audre Lorde and, you know, hear the message, you know, are you doing your work? And I must say, you know, everybody should think about it. Are you doing your work? And it, it doesn't, you know, and what does that mean? Are you doing your work? And, and are you making it happen? Are you making change happen? Um, are you applying yourself in the way to make, you know, change happen in the world for, for whatever you believe in? And, uh, you know, just do it. Gotta make this journey. Ashe and amen. <laughs> Ashe, Ashe. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you so much, Cheryl. So. Okay, yeah, bye-bye. Yeah. Bye. That was such a great conversation. Back to Ruby. This is really her time to shine this episode. She has become disillusioned with white people and, and whiteness because she thinks, like, she's seeing, like, okay, all these white women want to do is be Black and do what we're doing. She gets upset and she goes back to the house that white supremacy built. She's looking to confront William, but of course, William's not there. She's met with Christina, who she now knows that William has told her deepest insecurity to Christina. She gets upset and Christina's basically like, oh, it's the problem is that you're doing it wrong. You're doing whiteness wrong. Whiteness is about power, which is, you know, I'm really glad that somebody finally said it because that is what it is. Like their white privilege is just a nicer way to make white people feel comfortable with what is actually happening, which is the exercise of white power. So Christina is basically saying, wield your whiteness in a better way. What could you do with your whiteness that would fulfill you? And I think this kind of just goes back to the corruption that happens when whiteness is your goal, when anti-blackness is a tool to achieve whiteness. She, you know, is not necessarily um, going in defense of Tamara, her employee, because, you know, she does, as she's transforming the night before, she's transforming back into Ruby. She does witness her manager sexually harassing and attempting to assault Tamara. And Tamara defends herself and bites him and, and is able to get away. But if Ruby wanted to help Tamara in that moment, she could have. She just didn't. She just watched it and Tamara was able to get away. So when when Ruby goes to her manager's office to get quote unquote revenge, like it's really not for Tamara because Tamara has already protected herself. She's already saved herself. The revenge is for herself. It's for being overlooked. It's for all of these things that 
you know, she had all of her frustrations as a black woman and him as a white man who specifically kept her down as a black woman, but has obviously kept other black people down as well in this position of power. And she then uses her, you know, she, she goes into his office as Hillary one last time. She quits her job and then she seduces him, ties him up with his own belt and then uses her heel of her shoe to rape him. Yeah, but I was just like, really, Ruby, this is what you want to do <laughs> as your last act as a white woman? Like, this is what you want to do? If, if that is how Ruby wants to be Ruby uninterrupted, like, that is actually scary to me. That's what I'm saying. It's it's corrupt. She's 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 been, she's definitely been corrupted. Like, so now Ruby's a rapist, you know? And for what? Like, what? What what did you gain from that? At this point, William comes out of that basement, which is the only door in the house that is consistently locked. She calls him on it and she wants some answers. And so I guess at this point, you know, Christina's like, okay, cool. Well, here's some answers. And so she pops out of William um, after this really gross transformation, which is something that I think a lot of people did see coming because you never see William and Christine at the same place at the same time. And, you know, if Ruby can change completely into a white woman, why shouldn't she be able to use that to change into a man? And that you see that that's the whole point you know, the entire time too. She wants to be the leader of the Order of the Ancient Dawn um, that her father refused her because she was a woman. And so, of course, you know, she... And you also see in this episode, William lays out to Ruby how he got the potion. He got the potion from working with Hiram Epstein. Hiram Epstein, as we know, is the scientist who did all sorts of cruel... Um, experiments on black people in Letty's house and was extremely racist. So you see, once again, Christina's white feminism, it's totally fine to work with a murdering racist to achieve her goals. There should definitely at this point be no question about the fact that Christina is dangerous with the goal of using everybody around her, no matter who they are, to get her own purposes accomplished. Clearly there's some role that Ruby has to play. And I just hope that it doesn't end up with her like killed or killing somebody else that we really care about. I hope she has more sense than being used by Christina slash William by Will Stina. But um, I don't know where Ruby goes next. We will definitely see. I think that is the point of this show. Can you use the master's tools to tear down the master's house? And Letty is very clearly saying, no, you can't. Don't do it. What she used that worked, she used African spirituality. She called on the Orishas. You know, she used a completely different way of working that, you know, is not colonized, that is not indebted to white supremacy or beholden to white supremacy. And that's how she was able to win in episode three. And Tick is determined to decode this language of atoms and cast these same spells, but use it in a different way to protect it. It's kind of like, you know, that whole idea of like changing things from the inside, you know, that black police captain that's really going to turn things around. I mean, it's just, you know, it's kind of pathetic when you think about it. For centuries, this hasn't worked. Like, why are we still playing these games? Why do we still think that playing by their rules is going to get us to freedom? Like, it's just not how it works works. I mean, it just, even if you do achieve a little bit, you know, like you see Ruby, she's achieved a little bit. Like she's still not fulfilled and she's still not free. Has she achieved anything? But, um, she became assistant manager. She would have never been assistant manager, but as, as a black woman, a white woman. So Ruby didn't achieve anything. I mean, but she is it. reaping but, the benefits, you know, that, that's the whole point. Like, yeah, yeah, you play the game, you shuck and you jive, shuck and jive, shuck and jive, we shuck. you do that and then you win <laughs> a little bit. Um, but yeah, no, I mean, you become so corrupted. Like, who even are you anymore? It, it kind of echoes that Audrey Lorde quote, um, the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house, 
which is what Letty is telling Tick. And the quote goes, they may allow us to temporarily beat him at his own game, but they will never enable us to bring about genuine change. And I think we see that very clearly in Ruby's storyline and we're probably going to see it in Tick's, but I guess we'll just have to stay tuned. We will have to stay tuned. Also, what's up with the captain's body? Doesn't he have like a black man's torso or something Something he's it's different from the rest of his body I, for yeah. sure yeah because I, I so. was like is that a tattoo and i was trying to zoom in or something and, and it's i think he has like he he pulled he one of them some, Hiram joints exactly because he was definitely you know very good friends with Hiram. they were accomplices in their crimes against black people and so, yeah, it definitely looks like he's had some kind of surgery and taken some kind of body parts from Black people. And so we'll definitely see how Lancaster plays into this. And if Lancaster is going to be the main villain and William and Christina and Tick and Letty are somehow going to team up to stop Lancaster, um, which I feel like would be a bad idea. But, um, you know, I definitely feel like they're setting it up for him to actually be the bad guy here but he seems to be you know like samuel easily taken out it seems like the real problem is still christina and is going to be christina till the end of time um so we'll see which tools they use to dismantle her white supremacist ass i'm here for it and i can't wait to see (laughs) how it all comes together if you have any questions or comments please shoot them to us on twitter or instagram so we can discuss them on the show but we really appreciate everybody engaging with us um, on twitter and following and listening we love y'all Yes, thank you so much. Let's keep the conversation going. Be sure to use the hashtag Black Girl Watching on Twitter and Instagram. Check out our website, blackgirlwatching.com. Leave a comment there as well. And we will see you back here next Monday, back in Lovecraft Country. Black Girl out. Let her be born and handle warmly. This is for colored girls who have considered suicide, but are moving to the ends of their own rainbow.